This is the Philippines, a beautiful tropical archipelago of islands that forms one of the most important economies in the world today. This nation often flies under the radar as a quiet achiever, but it is both interesting and important to understand because it may be the quintessential 21st century growth nation. And that is not to say it's some super modern nation from the future, but rather it is to say that the story of the success and failures of the Philippines is by extension the story of the world today, as more and more countries modernize, embrace technology, trade internationally, and bring their citizens into the global middle class. Even putting the parallels of the Philippine and world economies aside though, the country is still fascinating to explore because it helps us to understand things like the impacts of population growth and decline on an economy. It is a perfect case study of the outsourcing boogeyman, as well as being a great look at what things like geography and demographics can mean to an economy. One of the most important things that most economists learn in school or university is that economics is not an isolated study. It is not a study where you can spend your entire professional career looking down an electron microscope. It is a very broad discipline which requires being broadly skilled in a range of academic pursuits like history, science, psychology, political science, and yeah, even things like theology. Bad economists will try and explain everything with ISLM curves, demand and supply charts, and rigid economic assumptions. Good economists will realize that economics is a social science and that science and history and politics and religion, they all have an impact on the economy. Some great economists realize that scientists and psychologists and historians may even be more knowledgeable about their respective fields than they are and go as far as to ask for help from these other faculties when crafting economic theories or discerning economic data. And I know, asking for help sounds like a pretty alien concept to a lot of economists, but the reason I am making such a big deal about this is that you cannot understand the economy of the Philippines without understanding a lot of these other things first. And the big one is geography. Now the Philippines is one of the most populous nations in the world, and when we look at very large populated nations, we can kind of recognize a pattern. This is China, this is India, and this is the United States of America. All to scale, these nations are the first, second, and third most populous countries on Earth respectively. And then, here is the Philippines. Notice anything different? Sure, the nation's population is not as large as these other three, but it's still around 110 million, which is huge. And the actual land mass of the nation is tiny. On top of that, what little landmass it actually does have is covered in mountains and broken up amongst thousands of islands, which causes problems. Bangladesh is the most densely populated country in the world, but Bangladesh has huge freshwater streams and open plains for this dense population to spread out over. The Philippines does not have this luxury. So despite having a slightly larger landmass and a smaller population, the whole country is just a little bit more cozy. Manila, the capital city of the Philippines, is the most densely populated city in the world. And the whole country itself is so starved for usable space that Manila has kind of grown out and merged with other cities to sort of form some Voltron of cities that is home to over 24 million people in a space only double the size of Atlanta's international airport. Now this has caused issues. Huge populations have their advantages though. GDP is a figure that most economists take very, very seriously. It is a measure of economic success and it looks at basically how much money is trading hands. The more money trading hands, the richer an economy is said to be. And by extension, things like quality of life are said to be better. The hope is that countries will improve an economy in order to increase their GDP. But an easy way to fudge these numbers is just to add more hands to juggle this money between. More people mean more jobs, more consumers, and more money changing hands, which means a higher GDP, even on a per capita basis. This isn't all lying with statistics type nonsense though. The economic impacts of squeezing more people closer together is actually measurable. More people bring more skills, more expertise, more competition, and more opportunity. 
This is one of the central reasons that city centres with dense populations are wealthier than rural areas. Now, in the Philippines case, they kind of just went ahead and made the whole inhabitable portion of the nation one big old city. The population of the Philippines is also still growing, which is unusual. Normally, as countries become wealthier, their population peaks and then starts to plateau off. Extreme examples are places like Japan, but even when looking at countries like Thailand, we can see that their population is still growing, but it's growing at a drastically lower rate. In fact, the birth rate in Thailand has dropped from 6.1 births per woman to only 1.5 births per woman in the last 50 years, which means that eventually Thailand's population will start to go backwards. The Philippines population is actually increasing at an increasing rate. Their birth rate is around 2.9 births per woman, which outside of things like African nations is one of the highest rates in the world. And it has to be asked, why? Why is this happening? Well, firstly the reason that birth rates tend to slow down in developing countries is that infant mortality rates drop, so there is less of a need to have six children in the hopes that three of them make it to adulthood. Developed countries also tend to transition away from smaller family businesses like farms and shops where people's children become their employees, so there is less of a push to have lots and lots of children here. On top of that, people tend to transition into dual income households, where both men and women will work in professional roles. All of these factors work to reduce the birth rates in wealthier countries, and all of these have taken effect in the Philippines, but their birth rate still remains stubbornly high. Strangely enough, a lot of this has to do with, among other things, theology. See, the Philippines was a Spanish colony, and when they moved out, they left behind religion, primarily Catholicism. Over 80% of the nation identifies strongly as Roman Catholic, and with that, there is an inbuilt disposition to have lots of children. It's the sort of statistic that's seen a lot in nations with a high population of Catholics. Now, there are of course still a lot of other forces at play, but it is a really interesting thing to recognise to explore how a wide array of academics' pursuits can go into explaining an economy. The rising population has not all been great news though, and a lot of people are talking about ways to curtail the issues starting to arise in this overcrowded nation. One of the more heartless sounding models that economists will look at is the supply and demand for labour in an economy. As with goods and services, the market for people is a market like any other. And in the same way that if you have a massive oversupply of Game of Thrones complete series box set DVDs and a huge lack of demand for them for some reason, you are going to have to massively lower the price by putting it on special to try and tempt more people into actually buying this rubbish. Economists model this process endlessly, but the whole thing makes sense anecdotally to most people anyway. What gets some people is that the same thing happens to workers. The Philippines has a lot of people, and especially a lot of young people, that are looking for work. The average age of the Philippines is just 25 years old, and almost the entire nation is either a child or of working age, which means there is a lot of supply of labour. The Philippines relies heavily on their export market above all else, which means they don't really have the same ability to create jobs with their domestic market like a more developed economy could, which effectively means a lot of people have to fight over very few jobs, which means the price of labour is very, very low. Things like Nannies and house sitters and gardeners are extremely commonplace in the Philippines because it is so cheap to hire these kinds of people. To anybody that has a decent job, oftentimes it is better to spend a little bit more time at work and hire an army of housekeepers to do any of the housework than it is for you to lose time working and do that stuff yourself. This is an issue that is both good and bad. Good in a sense that it is preferable for an economy to have a young workforce that can contribute actively to a society. For example, we have seen the issues of an aging population when we have explored economies like Japan specifically. But as with all good things, you can have too much. Too many young workers in a nation will mean a lot of growth. 
sure. But widespread underemployment causes issues around living conditions, it causes social issues, and it even causes economic issues where workers are denied things like education, which in turn limits how productive they can actually be. The Philippine government is aware of the issue and has actually taken steps to alleviate it. The first part is to educate people around how to plan out starting a family in a way that will actually fit with their means. And the second part is an attempt to attract more and more work into their country for these young workers by being the process center of the world. Companies around the world fall under a lot of scrutiny for things like low wage growth. In the United States, for example, middle income wages have been more or less stagnant for the past three decades, and there are a few pressures on this. Firstly, of course, the US economy is not growing at the same rate it was in the second half of the 20th century, but also the rising tide of things like automation and outsourcing are taking effect. What was once an entire team of engineers with slide rules is now a single engineer with cutting edge software. Call centers have been offshored to India and accounting departments have been moved to Manila. The Philippines has been one of the primary outsourcing boogeymen for the Western world. As we have explored, the nation has a very young, well-educated, and primarily English-speaking population that is, among other things, pretty famous for their discipline and process-driven attention to detail. This makes the whole nation a prime candidate for outsourcing process centers. Why pay $15 an hour to an American auditing team when you can send the work to the Philippines and probably have the work done more meticulously by someone earning $4 an hour. It just makes good business sense. For the Philippines, this is actually great. Sure, the pay isn't amazing for a Western economy, but in the Philippines, $4 an hour is incredibly good and put these people into a healthy middle class. On a nationwide level, it's even better. Sure, exporting things like manufactured goods or mine materials is great, and the Philippines does export these things as well, but exporting the productive efficiency of your workers is even better still. It is a renewable good that doesn't cost you anything to create and directly goes to creating strong jobs within an economy. It's also much harder to slap a tariff on a Skype call and an email, so exporting their workers' expertise to foreign companies is also advantageous for the fact that you don't need trade deals to facilitate this kind of business. The only people that really lose out in this whole situation are workers in Western nations who get outcompeted on price and potentially even quality by foreign competitors. The discussion over whether this is good or bad or just fair is a hotly debated one and not something that I'm brave enough to get into in this video. But it is certainly a big win for the Philippines and that's what matters here. The Philippines is an amazing economy with huge potential into the future. It's an economy based on using brains over pure industrial might to advance the lives of its citizens and its standings within the world market. But beyond this, it's a really great way to demonstrate how important it is to understand things about a nation's economy that we cannot put into an Excel spreadsheet. Geography makes things like infrastructure spending difficult, so the Philippines has a really low infrastructure budget, which causes things like dense populations brought around by processes that can be explained through anthropology and theology in a mix. The economy has boomed because workers in the Philippines are incredibly good at operating processes, which is as much a study of economics as it is of psychology. You could look at the economy of the Philippines, or any nation for that matter, based on the figures you see on the right hand side of a Wikipedia article. But any study, be it a dissertation or just a surface level case study for the sake of a fun little informative YouTube video, is all the better for recognizing that economics doesn't exist in isolation. And any findings will be all the better for considering a wide array of knowledge. Hi guys, and thanks for watching. As always, a huge thank you to our new patrons over on Patreon. We have introduced Patreon tiers, so if that was something that you were looking out for, you can head on over to our Patreon page and see what you can unlock by supporting the channel. 
But as always, your support continues to make this channel possible. We will be hosting the Q&A session live streamed on the second channel linked in the video description. If you want to be involved in that, come on over there or participate directly by joining our Discord server. Otherwise, if you did enjoy this video, please consider liking and subscribing. Thanks guys, bye.